Greetings fabulous fixers, it is I Mark from Mark Fixes Stuff and today we're going to look at a console that's very close to my own heart. I'm talking about the Sega Mega Drive. I particularly like the Sega Mega Drive because when it came out my friend Mark and I, yes another Mark, there's plenty of us, went into Hounslow to buy one. And there's a funny story attached to that so I'll tell you that whilst we're doing the modification. And the modification we're doing to this is we're going to fix it so it can play games from all regions. That's right, a region free mod. Now there are some region free mods which require switches in the back, toggle switches, which involves drilling the case. I'm really not into that, so we're going to do a switchless region free mod. When we've completed our mod, we'll test it and see if there's any difference in running the games. So without further ado, let's crack on right now. Mark Fixes Stuff. This channel is sponsored by PCBWay and they don't just do PCBs. If you want professional 3D printing, just upload your models, pick from a variety of materials and colours and you're on your PCBWay. Thanks to Elaine and the PCBWay team for supporting Mark Fixes Stuff. So this is our Sega Mega Drive, a fairly common console in the UK and pretty easy to come by and we'll be installing this mod from Duretro. It's switchless and switches between 50 and 60 Hz and also sets the console into the US, Japanese and European regions. Checking the underside of our console, we can see for sure that this is a PAL Mega Drive. It will only play cartridges in 50 Hz that are set to the European region or no region at all. I've already tested this console, so it's time to open it up. Opening up a Mega Drive is pretty easy. It only has six screws and they're here. There's no nasty clips. And I'll be using my ES20 electric screwdriver set that I'm constantly shilling from Kai Wheats. Seriously, I use this all the time. It's dead cheap and if you buy one, I'll get a couple of quid. It has a nice amount of torque, but not so much that you'll rip your retro to shreds. I really like the Mega Drive. It's got a great back catalogue, and when it was current, it felt a lot less sanitised than the Super Nintendo, so I, I really sort of cleaved to it. If you remember, a lot of the games were kind of censored on the Super Nintendo, so you'd have green blood instead of red, like that even mattered. Okay, keep the screws separate. There is a reason for this. With the screws out of the bottom, we can lift off the top shell. It's wise to be careful of the LED cable though. You can't actually disconnect it easily. The only way to take the LED cable off is to pull the legs of the LED itself up And with them straightened out, we need to physically pull this plug off of the LED leads. This is how it came out of the factory. I kid you not. Yep, it can take a while. And there we have it. We can put the top shell to one side for now. Later we'll need to come back and fit the triple colour LED. We have some more screws, as you could probably guess. And I want you to pay attention here because here's where a lot of people muck up. You see the screws inside the Mega Drive are actually slightly shorter than the ones outside. So be sure to keep those separate as well. This is where the forces of magnetism battle with the attraction of the metal shield. There's another screw hidden here which often gets missed. And of course, slipping around the back, there's yet more screwing to be done. Remember, these screws are different from the case screws, so do keep them separate. I'd like to take a moment here to talk about different types of screws because a mistake I often see is people putting the wrong thing in the wrong hole. Generally in old consoles, you'll come across two types of screws. This type, which is a machine threaded screw. It's used when there's a thread already existing in something like a piece of aluminium. 
You can tell because of its fine pitch thread and the fact that the end isn't very pointy. This is a self-tapping screw. These are made for going into plastic generally, and the reason that they are called self-tapping is they cut their thread on the first time they're inserted. And the name for cutting a thread is called tapping. With most of the screws removed, the only thing holding the top half of this shielding on is this bent piece of metal from the lower shielding. Just be aware of it, because if you don't know it's there, you might think there's another screw still holding the top shield down. To remove the shield, just lift it up whilst being careful of the LED cable. Although we will be removing this in a moment. With the top half of the shield removed, we can see the model of this motherboard. And this is an M5 PAL. There is also a VA4 variant, which has slightly different locations for this install, but it's still relatively similar and quite easy. This is when the question of recapping often comes up. I generally don't recap Mega Drives because I've seen quite a few of them and I've never found a bad cap in any of them. Let's remove the board from the shell. There's only six screws remaining, starting with these three here in the heatsink, right by the regulators. Notice that although these are going into aluminium, they're actually going straight through and screwing into the plastic underneath. Therefore, they're self-tapping screws and not machine thread screws. They're also a different length to some of the other screws in the machine, so keep these three separate on their own. The red stuff you can see on the heat sink is called thread lock. It's there to stop the screws working their way out of the aluminium through expansion and contraction due to heating. But because these screws aren't actually threaded in the aluminium, it's really useless and a bit redundant. The next screw is one that often gets missed because it's hidden here underneath the headphone jack board. Peekaboo! And then finally there's the two screws either side of the cart slot. We're nearly there. I've found that these screws here are the most prone to have broken posts. This is the highest stress part of the machine with the insertion and removal of cartridges. The board containing the DC jack socket isn't screwed in at all and can just be removed from its post. And with that, we can remove the board from the lower shell. Just bear in mind that the controller sockets will be poking out the front of the plastic case. Let's put this aside for later. This might have been a verbose explanation, but at least we know what we've taken out and exactly where it needs to go back. I've always felt that the Sega Mega Drive is a really tidy piece of engineering. Even things like these jumper pads that allow us to switch regions are really thinking ahead for engineering purposes. And we're going to be tying into these for our purposes today. But that does mean we've got to cut some traces. Specifically the ones between jumpers 2 and 3. My weapon of choice for this is a cutting bit. It's like a drill bit but has a flat end. Although in close up this might look like a massive gorge, in reality it's about 1mm wide and it would be easy to reinstate this track should we want to restore the machine back to its region locked condition. Really, I should have shown continuity before and lack of continuity after. We'll have to do that in reverse because I forgot to get my Kaiweet digital multimeter, link below. Sorry. We can see that there's no continuity between the two points where we've made the cut. Just as an example, I'll show you jumper three, which we haven't cut yet. And we can see there's no resistance and complete continuity. Let's cut that track and then we can test it again afterwards. This close up shot is an answer to everybody who wanted to see my bits in minute detail. Yes, I had to use a macro lens. It can be quite hard to see with the naked eye exactly what you're cutting. So I thought we'd go in nice and close here. As the copper disappears, so does the connection between the two points. There is an argument that using a scalpel is neater, but I find I have to hack away quite a lot more to break the connections. And when we put our test probe into the shot, we can see just how small these cuts really are. And how we've definitely severed the connection between those two points. Excellent. Our mod will need to interrupt the reset signal on the console. For that reason, we need to cut another track underneath the board. This is the last track we need to cut. It's right here, so nice and easy with our drill bit. In fact, the only awkward thing is the board is on an angle because of the heatsink. With that being said, we make short work of the cut. Ha! 
Again, using our multimeter to test for continuity, we can see that there's no longer an electrical connection between these two points. If we go back to where we cut, however, we can see that the connection does go up to the cut, but we've successfully broken it. So that's all the cutting done, and it's now time to prepare for a bit of soldering. Keeping our attention on the reset circuit, there's two points we need to tap into. The first one is on the leg of the reset switch right here. The second point is right here, interrupting that reset signal. Because this pad is quite small, we're going to clean away some of this green coating or solder mask using this tool here. It's a rubber abrasion tip. Using this in our Dremel will allow us to do some precise sanding. If I had to describe this, it's kind of like one of those school rubbers you used to have that allegedly rubbed out ink. Like this one. From the future was 8-bit. Thanks Rod. Ok, let's make ourselves a bigger solder pad. Start your engines. Using the lightest of touches, I gently dab away at the solder mask. The aim is to reveal the copper track, but not go through the copper track itself. Polishing off our efforts so far with a cotton bud shows we haven't quite got rid of the solder mask. So I use the tip of my rubber to just dab on top. When you see a little bit of copper coming off, then that's the best time to stop. A clean with isopropyl alcohol, and we can see we've made a really good site for soldering to right there. Obviously it's a good idea to clean off any of the copper that you might have liberated from the board. We don't want that to cause any problems down the road. With our sights prepared, it's time to get our mod out of its packet. Inside the bag, we have the mod itself in a secondary bag which contains some instructions. We also have some heat shrink tubing in three colours. There's red, there's blue and there's yellow, which should be helpful for our LED, which also comes out of the bag next. And lastly, we have what looks like 150 metres of bell wire. Seriously, this is a lot of wire for a small mod. Definitely not going to complain though. The mod board itself has some really nice large solder pads. This should be nice and easy. And finally, the LED. This is a three color LED, which means that it's got a red and a blue component. And of course, when you drive both of them at the same time, you'll get purple. Let's tack a wire to the switch leg and also to the pad that we just exposed. Grabbing hold of our packet of wire, we need to plan where we're going to route our wire to our mod board. Now I think we're going to put the mod board over here on the right, underneath the jumper section. We could orientate it upwards or sideways, but I think my preference is this way. The next part of the process is to lay the wire out roughly where we want it to come from and go to. We're going to need two pieces of wire. And let's go from there to there. We can always cut it shorter when we're soldering to the mod board itself. Although I don't want to go for a mad clean up of the board, I think we need to get rid of a little bit of the dust around the switch, at least whilst we're working. And let's get our soldering tools ready. First the solder fume extractor. Then we'll power on our soldering iron. We're going to be using 330 degrees today. That's in Celsius. And 330 degrees is because we already have leaded solder on the board, and this is indeed leaded solder wire. 60% tin and 40% lead, to be precise. Contrary to popular belief, it's not illegal or banned for home use. The solder on the board is already leaded as well. We're going to need some flux. Flux is really handy for working on old electronics. Flux is usually a mild acid. When it's heated, it activates and burns off any contaminants on the surface of the workpiece. As a part of my soldering ritual, I always clean my tip first. This is important because any old solder on the tip will have had the contained flux burned off and it won't want to flow onto the solder joints. For punching into this reset circuit, we really just want to tack onto the surface of the board. Another part of my ritual is when I'm putting my soldering iron down for a period of time, I like to clean the tip and then apply a small layer of sacrificial solder. This prevents the tip of the iron from oxidising due to the heat. 
The wire supplied is a single core and not the stranded type. This is often called bell wire. Typically, you wouldn't tin bell wire, but the reason I'm doing this here is because running flux core solder over the tip of the wire can remove any contaminants that will stop it sticking to the solder we've already put on the board. As we can see, it now tacks pretty instantaneously. Let's get that other wire done. I'll use the same method again. I have a preference to strip my wires, prep them, and then cut them to the size I want them to be on the board. And about there's perfect, I think. Again, the wire tacks well to our pre-prepared board. That'll do for us. For routing the wires, I think we'll go across the top of this chip, then all the way to the location of where I intend to put the mod board. We now need to add four wires to the jumper area that we were working on earlier. First, the left pads of jumpers two and three. Then a further two wires to the right pads of jumpers one and four. After that, we can stick our mod board into place. This really is a huge amount of wire that comes with this kit. I mean, it's a phenomenal amount of wire. I think we'll just use black on this occasion. We need four lengths of wire, roughly the same length. I'll make them too long so that I can cut them down as I'm soldering them. Here's some I prepared earlier. Of course, I'm going to prep the ends because I want them to tack nice and easy to the board. Believe it or not, this really does make a difference. Try it yourselves. Let's move our reset wires out of the way whilst we solder. And we'll use a bit more of that funky flux. Applying extra solder to these pads is quite easy, but it can take a little while for the factory solder to melt. We're just prepping up the pads that we need to do. Jumper one right, jumper two left, jumper three left, and jumper four right. The pick controller on the mod board will then take care of switching operations for our console. Now you're not going to see the best soldering because I'm working around the macro camera and it's really difficult to see what I'm doing. Please be assured that if anything looks dodgy, I went back afterwards and I reworked it. These really are quite small points. They look absolutely massive on the screen, but they're tiny. And that's our four wires to the mod board are prepared. Great. There's a little bit more preparation I'd like to do before we install our mod board. And that involves replacing the stock red LED with the triple color LED from the kit. Now this is where I'm not sure that the instructions are correct because on the instructions on the website for this mod, it says that the middle leg is ground, which is correct. The next longest leg will be red, which I'm not sure about. I think they might be blue and vice versa. It says the shorter leg is blue, but that might actually be red. That's my experience anyway, but let's believe the instructions for the sake of this exercise. The stock red LED is driven by these two wires. The white side is ground and connected to all points of the ground plane, but I think we need to remove this cable just to be neat and tidy. So let's clip it off. Please note it's not a plug and it's not plugged in. Now we've taken that off, we can prepare this pad for a nice bit of solder. All we need is a small blob of solder for a ground connection for our LED. The driving voltages for the red and blue elements of the new LED will come off of the mod board. I'll prepare a piece of wire roughly the same length of the existing cable for ground, and then two further pieces of cable that will go from that point all the way to where the mod board's going to be, roughly speaking. With these three lengths, we should be able to install our LED without too much trouble. I'm not too concerned about what color wire I'm using because it's easy to see on this project what wire is going to what point. 
If this was a more complex install, I'd probably use some different colored wiring. Okay, so going by the instructions, the middle leg is ground, and I totally believe that, so we'll use the yellow shrink tubing for that. And then we'll apply the other two colors as per the website. Still not sure though. Do make sure you put your shrink tubing on before you solder both ends of the wire. Yes, I think we've all been there. This looks like it could be fiddly, so I think what we'll do is we'll crop the middle leg nice and short. And then I've got a special hole to jam this in. It's on the side of my wire holder. Look here. I'd like to claim this as my design, but it's on Thingiverse. I'll see if I can find the link and put it in the description. It's dead handy. Let's try attaching that wire. It's always slightly fiddly trying to get bell wire to attach to a component leg. But that seems solid enough. Then we'll slide our tubing on, and because we have nothing else to solder to, it's time to install our mod board. I really like the extra care that Alan's gone to with the packaging of these mods. He's really thought about making them as easy to install as possible. The large solder pads are really good for tired eyes like mine. The reason there's unused pads is this is a multi-mod and he sells it in different versions for different consoles. After giving the board a bit of a clean, it's time to stick our mod down. Looks like the alcohol fumes have got to this gummy. Stand over there. And it's time for a satisfying peel. I have to say that the glue on these mods is some of the stickiest I've ever come across. So you really do need to make sure that you place it quite accurately. And I think that'll do. Never want to pass up the opportunity of using flux. Let's add some to the pads that we're going to be using on this mod board. I genuinely don't think that we need flux here, but you know, it can't hurt. With the flux applied, we'll pre-tin those pads that we're going to use as well. This will have a double benefit of ensuring that the pads have a pre-prepared surface to solder into, but also stopping us soldering to the wrong pads. Not that I ever would. Honest YouTube. The first wire we're going to install is this one that's slightly obscured by where we've put the board. It's not trapped by the sticky pad, but it is slightly underneath the edge, and it goes to the positive terminal on the board, supplying five volts. We'll bend it roughly to shape, cut it to length, strip it, and then we'll solder it onto the pad. The second wire needs to go down to pad nine. With that in place, our third wire goes down to pad 10. Again, this connects easily, and the included card with the mod is a really handy little guide. The last one of these four wires is JP1, which is a ground connection, and as such, solders to the minus marked pad on our mod. Try saying that three times fast. And that's all the region and hertz switching wires soldered to the module. Next it's time to connect up our reset circuit, and these are the two wires that we prepared earlier. We'll solder the wire from the button first. That needs to go to pad 13, which on our small instruction sheet actually says button. The other wire comes from the reset signal, that pad that we exposed earlier. This goes to pad number 8 on the mod, and again on the instructions, this is helpfully marked up as reset. Now that both of our reset wires are soldered, I set about trying to tidy up the wiring a little bit. I use a bit of Kapton tape to stop the wires from traveling around the board. And I think that will pretty much do for now. All these points have been soldered, so it's time to move on to the next part of this project, soldering the wires for the red and the blue elements of our three color LED. I'm sure it's no coincidence, but pad five will drive an LED when you're in 50 Hertz mode. So I think I'm going to connect that to the red leg, 
so that the LED is red when we're in 50Hz or European mode. That is of course if the LED legs are labelled right. I don't really care what colour they come up as long as it's consistent. With the 50Hz signal wired up to what I think is the red leg, let's prepare the blue leg in inverted commas. When all three of the legs have been soldered and sheathed up, we hit them with the hot air gun at about 140 degrees Celsius. This will insulate the legs and also give them a little bit more structural strength. Let's take the red lead and we're going to solder it to the 50 Hz pad. When that's done, we'll take the purportedly blue lead and solder that to the 60 Hz pad. And with that wire soldered in, that completes all the soldering for this mod. We soldered the LED. We've soldered our reset interrupt circuit. And we've soldered all of our 50, 60 Hz and region switching pads. Now it's time to get a bit hacky because we need to install our LED. The original LED is actually installed from the top of the case, but that's not going to work for us. So we need to pop out this part of the top bezel. And with that out, we can see that the red LED is actually dropped through two holes in the case. I can't get my fingers on it, so we'll just use these side cutters to grip it and pop it out. With the LED out, we can see that there's no way for us to fit our three-legged larger LED in this hole. So we're going to need to make this hole bigger. The original LED is about 3mm. Our replacement LED is the same nominal size. I know that whilst I'm drilling, the plastic is likely to slightly melt. For that reason, I'm going to use a drill bit smaller than the LED itself. About 2.6mm is fine. I'm drilling through gently on the slowest speed. After that, I cleaned out any plastic debris with a brush. This Mega Drive could probably do with a bit of a wipe over. There's a few bits of ingrained dirt around the buttons and the controls, and some around the top of the bezel as well. Whilst I give this Mega Drive a bit of a spruce up, why don't I tell you the story of my friend Mark and the Mega Drive? It was around January of 1991. Me and my bestie Mark Mega were well into video gaming. Mark had left school a couple of years before me, so he had a job and he was quite well established in a company called Texas Home Care. He had actually worked himself up to a pretty good position, so was quite well paid for our age. I was living in a place called Feltham, and Mark was living in a place called Hamworth, actually in the Oriel Estate. He would get the bus to Minimax Corner, near where I lived, and then I would join him on the bus on the 237, and we'd go into a town called Hounslow. Mark was a big gamer. He'd had all the consoles and he was dead set on getting a Sega Mega Drive. He'd just been paid and he had a wadge of cash. So upon arriving in Hounslow High Street, we headed straight to the famous chain store, Dixon's. Mark wanted to buy a bundle, so naturally asked if he could try a couple of the games. The salesman took one look at us and told us to F off, and I quote, this isn't an arcade. Mark was a bit shocked by this. However, as I'm a vindictive bastard, and I know that they were all commission based, I told Mark to get out his money and wave it in the guy's face, which he then did. He also told him that we were going to go to Curry's and buy the same bundle for £10 more. The salesman tried following us out of the shop down the high street, telling us it was a joke and he was just having a laugh. Of course, he soon gave up, but Mark did buy a Mega Drive that day, and although it was out of our way, we made sure that we walked back past the Dixon's window, knocking on the window and pointing proudly at Mark's new purchase. You really shouldn't judge a book by its cover, should you? Do you have any stories like that? Let me know in the comments section below. As I said earlier, those posts are actually a very, very common point of failure, and we've glued that. A quick note here, the hole for the bezel wasn't quite deep enough to allow our new LED through. It only sat about here in the hole. Using my drill bit, I reamed it out a bit more just to allow the LED to come in a bit more proudly. It's kind of tapered now. I also found that the hole in the case wasn't big enough, so I've reamed out the rest of the aperture, and now that LED will fit all the way through. 
It was fine for the original LED to sit back because it was just saying that the console was on, but we really want our new LED to be quite proud so we can see what region we're in. As you can see, that's going to be visible from all angles. With all our drilling and dry fitting done, it's time to go for an actual install. I'm going to simply get the LED in the position I want and then use hot snot to hold it in place. But I'm not going to do that until we've got all of the rest of the components back in the case. So in goes the shielding. It's been 24 hours since resin gluing our broken post, so whilst it's nice and solid, unfortunately there's a pocket of resin in the bottom of the well. This will stop our screw going in properly, using our drill bit as a depth gauge. We can see that we've only got a shallow hole. When we compare it to the other hole, we can see how much we need to drill out. I'm going to use this bit of Kapton tape as a depth gauge. I don't want to accidentally drill through the bottom of the console. Thanks so much for being a patron, it really means so much to me. Your support helps me achieve so many things and I genuinely cannot thank you enough. With our hole drilled out, we have a quick clean up. And then using our drill bit again as a temporary depth gauge, we can see we can get all the way to the bottom of the hole. Now it's time to install our mainboard again remembering our little friend, the bent tab. We need to make sure that our mainboard goes underneath the tab and not on top, otherwise it will make it difficult to screw the mainboard down. Using our two screws that we put aside for our cart slot, I grab my ES20 electric screwdriver and get to screwing. Our glue post takes a bit more torque as our self-tapping screw has to tap a new thread, but the other post is a lot easier. Next we'll replace the screw that's hidden by the headphone socket, and then the three heatsink screws. When replacing a screw in plastic, don't forget to back off the screw anti-clockwise until the thread of the screw drops into the thread of the hole. This avoids cutting a new thread, which in turn would weaken the existing screw hole. With that pesky tab bent up, we can put the top shielding back on. I'm routing our LED cabling through this post hole, I think this is the most direct route. You could alternatively put it through the hole in the middle of the shielding at the front. With the shielding back in place, I push that tab back down and set about quickly replacing those screws. 10 points if you can remember what the screw that goes into the aluminium thread is called. Give yourself 10 points and a party seven with the lid off if you said a machine thread screw because you'd be right. This earth connecting screw is the one fastener in this machine that has a valid use for this thread lock, but I don't have any so we'll pretend that never happened. The last few screws go in. Of course, not forgetting the screw that I always forget about over here. Ta-da! Replacing the headphone jack board and then replacing the power connection board under the watchful gaze of Terry and Dave we're almost ready to put our top shell on, which means we're almost ready to glue our LED in position. Exciting times. Enjoy your trip. Okay, it's LED gluing hot snot time. We're just going to pop it into the case and glue it into position. Pushing it in as far as it will go will give us the desired result. I don't generally use hot snot for much, but it is useful for things like this. The really good thing about hot glue is if you muck up positioning something, if you heat it with a hairdryer, you can reposition it. Also, it's really graphically drippy. Ooh. Coming back in five minutes, our hot fluid has turned to a turgid white. And our LED is definitely fixed in place. That looks pretty good. And with the LED being a bit higher than the original, I think we'll get a good degree of visibility. Just making sure that none of the cabling is going to be trapped, I replaced the top shell back on the console and burnt my hand on the effing glue gun. When I put the top shell on the Mega Drive, I always make sure the on switch is in the on position, the volume is at the minimum, and the reset button is ready to rock and roll. That way they connect up easily. Okay, let's pop these screws in super duper fast and then we can try our creation. 
Terry and Dave watch on excitedly as we do the final preparations. And there we have it. There we go. It's done. I don't know what else to say apart from, I think it might be time to test this. To power the console, I'm running about nine volts from my bench supply. The center pole on the jack connection is negative. We're not gonna hook this up to the TV. We're just going to see what the LED does. Powering on the console gives us a red LED, although it's difficult to see in the filming lights. Let's turn those off a bit. Yep, there's red. Holding down reset, it will cycle through the colors. And when you release the button, it will stay on that color. In this case, blue, whatever that is. It turns out that blue is EU PAL. Purple is USA NTSC, leaving red, which is Japanese NTSC. The opposite wiring on the LED legs to what I was expecting, but my disappointment didn't last for long as I cracked on and played a bit of Truxton. This is a cracking game, and here we're playing it in European PAL at 50 hertz. And it certainly doesn't feel slow to me. In fact, I played this for a good 10 minutes. Then I fired up the same ROM from the multi-carp in Japanese mode. The game then presents itself as Tatsujin. This means mystery in Japanese, and the mystery is certainly solved. It's night and day. The gameplay is so much snappier. The playfield is bigger, and I can't help feeling that we were slightly robbed by our PAL television system when it came to games that had originated from Japan. Despite the gameplay being faster, I actually found this easier. And I don't know why. Maybe it's because I could move more freely around the screen. Maybe it's because anticipating the bullets of the enemies felt more natural. But whatever it was, I enjoyed it a whole lot more. I genuinely cannot imagine myself going back and playing the PAL version of Truxton when I know that the NTSC 60Hz version of Tatsujin or Truxton in the US exists. I'm not the best gamer, but I found it really difficult to actually turn this off, even though I was recording the video. Next, we try Ghouls and Ghosts. This is a pretty famous one because again, it presents as two different titles, depending on the region that you're set in. Again, in PAL, the gameplay seemed fine, although we are back to that slightly squashed playfield. I'm terrible at this game, to be honest. Booting up into Japanese NTSC, we're greeted with a different title, Daya Makaimura, which roughly translated means Great Demon World Village. The playfield is bigger, but I'm not sure if the gameplay is any faster. I'll let you be the judge by looking at this footage. Another game I tried is the ape platformer Toki. Again, it's squashed in PAL, but we didn't know any better, so we just played this game. And I really enjoyed Toki back in the day. Booting up into Japanese, we get full screen again. It's slightly faster. Although I still haven't got a Danny LaRue what's going on in this intro. And Toki's had a name change. He's now called Juju, with the game being called Legend of Juju. I don't even know why they changed that for the European and American markets. One thing I should mention is if you want to fit a genuine Japanese Mega Drive cartridge into your European Mega Drive, you'll need to cut the slot. I've opted not to cut the top shell, preferring to order a slot extender or riser off of eBay. So is this mod worth doing? Well, yes. Overall, it's a great mod and a lot of fun to install. Links to tools and things I've used below and thanks to Meme Machine Dean for the console and Alan at Diretro for the mod. Big thanks to my amazing patrons appearing on the screen right now. Did you know that one of your patron perks is you're able to summon a spirit T-Rex to come to your defense at any time, day or night? This might not be true. Thanks patrons, you really do make these happen. Why not watch one of these other videos? You know you're going to, so why resist? Resistance is futile.